we have with us um, five esteemed scholars who really focus on this virtual workspace. And they've done a lot of work in this area for years before the pandemic. And so we thought it would be great for them to really talk to us about you know, the insights from research on women's career equality and virtual work, you know, what, what do we know so far? Where do we go from here? And so I want to introduce um, our moderator, Lauren Burnett. She's a doctoral student in the management department at uh, GW, George Washington University. And her full research interests include gender effects in conjunction with virtual work diversity practices and the intersection of gender and race in the workplace. And um, to my far left, I have Shavit Bharat Naham, is the head of Moody's uh, Global Talent Strategy and Employment Experience, Employee Experience. So she's responsible for developing innovative strategies, tools, and processes for really the business-driven talent, um, really delivering an exceptional uh, employee experience um, as well. Um, Next to her, we have Dr. and Sharon Hill, um, who is a professor of management at GW as well. Um, she is a leading scholar on virtual work, um, telecommuting, hybrid work, virtual teams, et cetera, and studies positive and negative impact of working virtually to understand how to achieve success of virtual outcomes. She has published in numerous um, peer-reviewed uh, journals here in academia and also has an extensive career in industry prior to joining so she can speak out of both lenses. Um, then we have um, Ellen Ernst Classic. Um, she is the Basil S. Turner Distinguished Professor of Management at Daniel School of Business at Purdue University, another Big Ten school. Um, she was previously a distinguished professor in um, the School of Labor and Industrial Relations at Michigan State. Um, she is a fellow at the Academy of Management, um, Social and Society of Industrial Organization and Psychology has also written in numerous um, academic uh, publications. Her research interests, um, including field experiments and management training interventions, include leader and organizational support of work family relationships, flexibility, technology, remote work, work life boundaries, something I know I personally need to listen in on a little more, and um, gender and diversity inclusion. So she's partnered with corporations, governments, et cetera, to really produce the research. And we have virtually, because this is a conference on hybrid and remote work, Isabel Villamor. Um, she is an assistant professor of the Managing People and Organizations Department at IESE. Um, and her research really seeks to understand how different aspects of contemporary workplaces affect career equality. Um, her primary research stream investigates the impact that increased virtu virtuality at work has on women's careers. So um, with that, I am just going to stand here to play keystroker, um, but I want to turn it over to Lauren, and I'm really excited to kick off this panel with you all. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for the introduction. So to set the context for our session, I wanted to provide a brief overview of the research upon which it's based. Um, it's based on an article in the Academy of Management Annals published by V. Moore, Hill, Kosick, and Foley. Um, a lot of the authors are represented here with us today. And it asks the question, how does virtuality at work impact women's career equality? So in this case, we're defining virtuality as um, working not face-to-face, -face, so dispersed could either be working from home or working in a virtual team, as well as relying on technology to communicate. Um, and so virtuality has obviously increased with the pandemic um, and it continues to um, increase. And so with this major change in the work for, in the workplace, we want to understand how that impacts women's career equality or the extent to which they um, have work and non-work outcomes relative to, to men and their equal participation um, in work. And this can include things such as their career progression and promotion, but also their work-life balance. Um, and so for the research, uh, they analyzed 100 articles uh, across disciplines that were published from 1995 to 2021 about career equality in virtual work. And the evidence reveals itself um, as really a double-edged sword for women. There are career enhancing as well as career damaging effects, and it depends on the interaction of the uh, virtuality dynamic and the gender dynamic. And so these manifest as um, three tensions. That was a lot, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, yeah, so these sanctions are what we will discuss today. They're the work and non-work boundary control or interference sanction, enhanced but also reduced job opportunities, social integration, as well as exclusion. And so our session today will have two parts. First, we'll discuss the current research and um, insights from organizations, and we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. And then the next part, we will discuss future or implications for future scholarship and practice. And so with that, I would like to um, turn to our panel for their insights on the current research. So first, Ellen, um, <laughs> Pull up the next slide, Jill. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what are the key research findings and manager implications regarding the work, non-work boundary control and interference tension? So uh, hi again, can you hear me okay? Is this working? Okay, there we go. Um, I did one of the early studies on telework um, back 2006, including some New York companies. And at that time, formal flexibility uh, was thought to give people work-life balance. And what we found in the study was that uh, what mattered so much uh, for well-being, work-family conflict, productivity, job satisfaction, was not necessarily whether you're saying, I'm formally teleworking, but whether you felt in control of work-life boundaries. And this was long before the pandemic. And uh, implementation is really what matters. And a lot of the literature tends to oversimplify, depending on your lens, whether you say, gee, flexibility is great for women's careers. Uh, those were often, the psychologists tend to be more positive. I don't know how many people study psychology in the room. And the sociologists would be kind of like, oh, you're gonna be stereotyped in your gender roles and marginalized. So I think one of the takeaways from this project, and it was great to work with, represent different disciplines in some ways, although we're all organizational behavior, is you need to measure the mixed effects of flexibility. And then you need to, as the previous panel said, look at who's using it more. And a lot of the literature, if you go to the next slide, uh, really focuses, these are all on different types of uh, policies. And the literature is not, we, we have very few studies that measure uh, whether this leads to higher performance or not with the control group. And that was one of the things I would encourage the businesses here is just to do pilot studies, partnering with us to evaluate. So really flexibility is about control over the work role boundary. And when you use telework, such as gives you control over work location, but it could also give you synergies over work scheduling, right? You don't have to commute. So you have that extra hour to restructure. So that's another form of work control. It may or may not give you control over permeability, whether you're interrupted by family members right at home, whether you're looking at Facebook or uh, whether your boss is texting you at night. So you need to think of all these different forms of flexibility and how to not create good or bad combinations. So that's the bundling approach. Workload is another problem, right? We academics feel that. And uh, many women then I think are going into work intensification. They may not, if they have, and I have four children, may not have childcare set up at home, or they may be expected to do all of the uh, home tasks and their jobs. So I think the, the proof is in the pudding on implementation. Uh, I would like to mention years ago, I did a webinar for Booz Allen about people who were remote workers as an employee resource group because they felt marginalized then. And I kind of feel we're, we're, we, we haven't learned from the past and I look forward to having more of a conversation. So I'll, I'll stop here with one final thought that I think that leaders tend to think that if you have access to flexibility, you have work-life balance. And they have not integrated into how we, their work processes. I, the business term, baking it in, the companies that are embracing remote work whole hog are baking it in as a way to attract talent. And yes, many women are the talent. They're less likely to be marginalized if that's the way the company works. And it's not uh, taken up more by women than men or women of color, or women uh, that uh, maybe are removed from the corporate headquarters. But one last thought, and I will then truly stop, is I've been in the UK doing work, and uh, one of the scholars there said there's also a class difference that, uh, you know, if you're in a small apartment, <laughs> working at home is not great for you, and you're very isolated, and you don't get that career boost. So I would like, encourage us the rest of the day to sort of integrate these lenses. 
Thank you, Ellen. Um, so Issa, we have online. Um, I wanted to ask, what are the key research findings and manager implications regarding the enhanced and reduced job opportunities tension? You're lying. Thank you so much. So basically what we found was that uh, there's three main... Kevin. Can you hear me properly? Hold on one second. Perfect. Seven. There you go. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Lisa, go ahead. Sure. So I'm going to focus on the second tension and what we found from research regarding these enhanced, but at the same time, reduced job opportunities. And basically, what we said is that remote work uh, increases, uh, has three positive sides regarding flexibility, broader career paths, and leadership. So, from the positive side, those were the three things. First, regarding flexibility, we found that remote work allows women to not have interruptions in their career or not as many. So for example, whenever women uh, tend to become moms, they used to leave the workplace more than they do now, thanks to remote work. And this has important implications because we know that, for example, for the gender pay gap, career interruptions is one of the most critical factors. The second one has to do with broader career paths. And it's related to the fact that location flexibility allows women to accept global leadership roles without relocating their families. So we know from previous research that moving to another country, they need to be more complicated for women in dual career couples and with families. And now with more remote uh, global roles offering in the workplace, women can access these global roles that tend to have a positive impact in their careers. And the final positive uh, aspect of this tension is related to leadership. Uh, we found several papers that mentioned how women's collaborative leadership style is well suited for remote environments. And these co collaborative and relationship oriented leadership styles are especially suited for these remotes. However, we also found a negative side of this tension that had to do with three main uh, problems, and they are stigma, travel demands, and constant availability. So the first one, the stigma, we found that it is the case that uh, when women do use remote uh, work options, they tend to be stigmatized more than men, even just by asking for them, because we tend to imagine that when a man is working remotely, he's really working, when a woman is working remotely, she might be doing some family-related staff issues. The second one had to do with travel demands. So it's fantastic that remote work allow women to have these global remote jobs, but they tend to imply more traveling demands, and sometimes they are more difficult for women with uh, children or high family demands. And the third one was availability. And what we found is that um, previous research has shown is that Global roles tend to imply staying connected after work, and that might be more difficult for women because they tend to have more responsibilities outside their job schedules related to their families. So these were like the three negative parts that we encountered in that tension. We also look at what were the things that were making these uh, sides of the tension stronger, and with no surprises, you can imagine motherhood was one, that increases both the positive and the negative side. So flexibility is something that uh, mothers tend to appreciate even more in order to be able to deal with those other responsibilities. But they also fa face most of these negative stats that I just explained. And we also saw that when we're looking at what do we know about companies and what they do, what can they do in order to reduce this stigma. And we we'll find that uh, how companies frame remote work is critical to impact the stigma that remote work is hard. So not framing it as a women issue or a family-related issue, but as an opportunity for employees is critical. Also making sure that decisions are based on results and not presence. So prioritizing those result-oriented evaluations rather than looking at who's in the office, that presentation bias that was described in the previous panel. 
Uh, and also when they frame the ideal worker, not framing it as someone that has to be in the office. That has a huge impact on how people do see the opportunities to work remotely. And the final one, which is also pretty obvious, is considering when you ask people to travel, either to the office or to meet with colleagues, explain why is it necessary. And if it's not essential, don't ask people to travel, either to meet colleagues or remote work, because that's going to be more complicated for people who have more responsibilities outside work. Thank you so much, Issa. Um, so Sharon, uh, what are the key research findings and manager implications regarding the social integration and exclusion uh, tension? All right. Uh, am I good? Can everyone hear me? Is that good? All right. Closer? All right. How's that? All right. So I'm going to speak briefly to the final tension, the social integration exclusion tension. And this is the one that we found in our review actually had received the least amount of research attention. So I think I look forward to some of the future research discussions around this one. Uh, but when we think of social integration, what we're really referring to is the extent to which women are able to form positive bonds and have positive interactions with others in the workplace. And there are really two areas that have been looked at, and again, limited research here, but I think, I think they flag some important areas, and I'll talk to each of these a uh, couple of areas uh, one at a time. So the first one has to do with uh, the extent to which women feel included in their work groups and able to have influence and participate. One of the things we know from past research is that women do tend to be perceived as lower status in work groups and that influences their uh, willingness to speak up, their feeling of inclusion and their feeling that they can participate and have an influence. And so there is some research to suggest that when we take away the face-to-face -face interaction and uh, communication is occurring within work groups and interactions and discussions, using leaner communication media where we don't have much of as many as the visual cues that kind of uh, signal status, women feel a little bit more free to feel to speak up, to participate and, and thus have more influence in their work group discussions and their interactions. Uh, but interestingly, there's a negative side to this. There's kind of a separate stream of research that also shows when it comes to how others then perceive women and treat women, the absence of some of those cues that can, some of those information cues that can uh, offset the gender stereotypes that people might have, might actually cause them to focus more on gender and enhance some of those stereotypes. So interestingly, there's a separate stream of research showing that uh, in leaner communication environments, some of these gender stereotypes that others hold towards women can actually be reinforced, which affects how they're assessed, and even maybe some of the task assignments that they get. And because this research is somewhat uh, as not as robust as some of the other areas, we don't really true ha have a great understanding of you know, what make, what's gonna help us uh, reap the positive aspects of this tension versus the negative aspects. Let me talk about just one other area where we found a couple of studies that I think is quite interesting. And that's regarding women's social uh, networks. So we do know that women tend to, again, I'm speaking in generalities here, but on average have smaller networks, professional networks in the workplace. But, some of the uh, virtual communication, social media applications can be used to really good effect to have a, give women an opportunity to expand their social networks without necessarily always having to have face-to-face -face interaction. And we know organizations, for example, such as Microsoft are doing that to really good effect. The one caution though on the negative side is that we've got to be careful that those same tools aren't being used in an informal way to form networks that actually exclude women Right? And we did find studies that found some evidence of that happening. So I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to talking about some of the future research ideas around this tension. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so uh, from your perspective, Shavit, what, is, what have you observed with regards to these tensions or others within organizations, and what are the best practices for managing these from your perspective? Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, so there's just so much truth to everything that's been said. Um, I can't underestimate it enough. Um, 
it, the tensions exist and it is really truly a double-edged sword, but there are responsibilities that fall across the board on a number of places that have to be addressed in order to really manage these tensions well. It's not, there's not one secret panacea. There's not one company that's, that's getting this right. I was uh, taking the ferry back yesterday and I was riding the ferry with a woman from Goldman who I actually do Pilates with. And she, um, and she said, yeah, we're forced to come back five days a week. I'm looking for work. And, um, and, she, and they had the whole uh, bad swipe situation where they're, you know, so she said, I go in at 11 and I leave by four just so that I can be there and I can manage my life. I do, I take some calls from home in the morning and then I take the ferry in and then I go in and I do my face and that's just not a sustainable way to be. Um, and so there's kind of three places where I think the tensions need to be addressed. First of all, we need to address them within ourselves because we're conflicted about what we want. We believe that we can do it all, which we can. I do believe that. Um, I also have four children. It is possible to have a career. It is possible to read. And I have four girls. So it's all about, I feel bad for my husband some days, but it is all about women power in my house and how to make the right choices. And we have to be really much, much better about learning how to set boundaries and how to manage those boundaries. So there's a piece that's on every single one of us and being able to really be able to express and say and feel psychologically safe enough to say how we feel, what we need, and what it takes for us to thrive and flourish at work. The second piece is really on management. And it's not enough to teach women or men or any community how to set boundaries or how to ruthlessly prioritize. We also need leaders and managers to role model the behaviors we need them to not only learn how to manage boundaries, we need to teach them how to respect those boundaries and also how to challenge their own biases, which are deeply ingrained in every single one of us, no matter how much we say we're open-minded and we're progressive and we have lots of ideas. We all have biases. We all have the ways in which we grew up and how we learned how to work. And we all have the ways in which we expect the people that work for us to do it. But I do a lot of focus groups um, in my role as the head of employee experience. And I always ask people, why do you come and why, why do you stay and why would you leave? And that answer has changed. And the number one answer is about flexible work. So I come because the company offers me flexibility and I would leave if that flexibility were to go away. And that flexibility means lots of different things. And then the third place where we have to address these tensions is actually on an organization and system level. And it has to do with policies and practices and being clear and being able to publish those and having a point of view and a philosophy. So I'll just give one very quick example of what we do at Moody's. We are our flexible working philosophy or approach. It's called purpose first. And it starts with the job. What are the things that you do every single day? And do they require you to interact in a collaborative, innovative way with someone where you have to do it live? Or can you do heads down work where you have to focus and that work could be done really from anywhere? And so for us, we kind of went away from um, thinking about it in any other way than using the office as actually a tool, not a destination, and thinking about heads up work and heads down work and so the purpose of your role and the things that you do every day should drive how and where you work. I have a team that's global. I have a woman that works for me in London, one, two women that work for me in Costa Rica, one woman that works for me in India. I don't see them every day. I don't even see them once a year. And so I've had to learn how to manage those relationships um, in a different way. And, if, and I wouldn't manage those relationships differently if we were live or if we're virtual, because I have a very global and virtual team. So we've got to really not just teach people how to set boundaries, we've got to teach people how to respect boundaries. And then we've got to set up the right structures and policies in the organization that help to prevent burnout, that help to find what we call kind of that Goldilocks moment, right? Of like, not, in, not just in all the time or not just remote all the time, but what's that just right thing for you and your job and it starts obviously with an understanding of what your work and your role is. It continues to an understanding of what the expectations are between you and your manager, but overwhelmingly it has to be supported by what is the company policy around this? And how can we make sure that all leaders across the company, that, that the senior most leaders set the right guardrails and expectations and have clarity around what's expected and 
where you have flexibility. For us, we see it as a social contract between the company and our employees. And this was said before in the previous session, we really need to treat people like adults. And when you treat people like adults, they show up like adults. But when you treat people like children, they show up like children. Great insights, thank you so much. So I wanted to provide an opportunity for um, Q&A with the audience. So we have um, online, we have a, a Q&A open, um, but in the room as well, anybody have any questions for the panelists? <laughs> So the question was, what are ways that we deal with, that we help um, people manage isolation and being away or just feeling, you know, purely like alone on an island? And it, we started to see it actually during the pandemic. And um, what, one of the things that we started at Moody's is a program called Moody's Moments That Matter. And basically, at the beginning, we all went fully remote overnight. We didn't skip a beat. We had record earnings. I mean, it was just like all of those... Um, uh, ideas that people had that a fully remote workforce just isn't going to be able to be productive was were dispelled within an instant. However, there were definitely some backlashes for that. And many people really felt alone and isolated. And we as humans have a deep need for relationships. So we did, we started this series called Moody's Moments That Matter. And every week we interviewed people on different topics. And one of the topics we did was isolation. One was about parenting. We did topics on mental health. We did topics on ergonomics and how to set up your home office, how to avoid back pain. We did meditation sessions. Every week it was something else. And we had senior leaders come and talk about it. But we also made sure that we really included people that were very remote, that were off somewhere and by themselves. And they shared their best practices of what they do to stay healthy, what they do to stay mind healthy, what they do to stay integrated. We talked about different social communities. We have a lots of business resource groups. And we did, um, and even when we came back to the office, we do events that are 100% virtual so that nobody feels like I'm, I'm having a different experience because I'm on a Zoom screen or a Teams call. I'm having the same, we needed to equalize the experiences and we got so many people that sent us notes that said, you know, I really felt like I was alone in this. But now that I hear all of these things that people are saying, I feel like I'm not alone. I'm not the only person that feels that. And just that moment of being able to identify with somebody else's pain or tension or anxiety started to bring people closer. And those people started to create little affinity groups with each other to keep themselves connected and sane. So we did games, we did activities, but we also just talked about how people were feeling and we created space for that to be there. And then we also made sure that we put in practices that allowed people, that, that really democratized the idea of virtuality so that everybody could have a similar experience and that we weren't isolating people that were already feeling isolated. And uh, she did talk about how uh, the, the BP I'm working with, how many uh, remote workers do say that they're uh, feeling isolated, but they're also expressing it more to people online after the pandemic, and yet companies need to do these holistic strategies. The second thing I want to say is I've been involved with a uh, randomized control trial funded by National Institute of Health on training leaders to be more work-life supportive. We have four behaviors, role modeling, emotional support, creative work-life management, and instrumental support. And then we thought, found for some new policies like supporting people during maternity leave or if a family member is having issues, um, one is the idea of respecting time off, so the, and also teaching leaders that. And the second is uh, psychological safety to use the policies. And I think we need to really integrate managing of hybrid work 
and the leadership development program, managers do not see work-life issues as part of their core job responsibilities. And so we need to mainstream it. Thanks, Ellen. I think we had a question over there. Yep, so um, I have a question just thinking about women's careers and equality as women advance. Um, so in my prior life, I was in the federal government in an organization that right before the pandemic, we were re-envisioning our physical office space. And every employee was asked, how much time do you want to spend in the office? And then that in turn informed business protocol around redesigning the building in terms of how many people would be expected to do. So employees got like free choice, free reign to determine um, you know, what was going to be the best scenario for them. It helped that we had a leader at the top who, um, you know, was an innovation researcher, and so he was all about productivity. But my question is, when we did this, the employees felt, like, very empowered, uh, but middle managers freaked out. And so my question here is that it's fine, you know, I, th I think it's important that from the top down, you know, think through these strategies, but what are we doing to train middle managers? What are we doing to help middle managers um, deal with situations that probably feel out of their control, both in terms of what they're being told they have to do in terms of workplace flexibility, and then also, um, you know, how they perceive their staff and how they best like to manage based on, you know, in, either in competition or um, that aligns with the workers I can I can maybe start off on this one so <laughs> my understanding of the question generally is uh, focusing on that middle management level there's just a high degree of discomfort with uh, you know leading in these environments and empowering employees right and so how can we help them better deal with that or what do we do about that I don't have all the answers but I do think that uh, it does go back to an earlier discussion on the panel and the previous discussion is that they just don't know what they don't know we are not organizations in general are just not preparing managers for leading in that mode. So I teach an online course at George Washington in leading the hybrid workforce. And to it's a, an elective for our uh, master's level students. And I kind of poll the class, what are your, most, nearly all of them are working. So I poll the class, what are your organizations doing uh, to prepare? And invariably the answer is very little, right? And I do have students who come into the class really saying, yeah, I kind of thought I knew everything I need to know about leading in this mode. And by the end they say, you know what? Uh, maybe I didn't know as much as I thought I need to know. So I do think there just needs to be more intention around um, training and creating awareness. Uh, so that, that's one step. And then we can talk about a lot of it is control and lack of trust. So I think we can have another conversation around how do we help um, them understand that there is a way of leading where you can still keep alignment with what's going on and making sure the mission's being accomplished, but also letting go. And so we think about a more empowering leadership style. And so talking about that. And again, this is new, right? And so uh, that's kind of what I would throw into the mix. On the manager i think we need to not put everything on the manager but we need to train teams and i worked with northern trust to document their migration of whole teams depending on their role and and i think that that makes it so that there is coverage team contracts and i think we've also ignored that level of analysis thank you i think we have time for just one more question um you can go ahead Yes, you do. <laughs> but we gotta, we're going to go to the mic because the folks online can't hear it. So, I'm going to ask a question. So I lead a employee resource group, a women's employee resource group, and I get a lot of feedback from colleagues who are global in the field. And I just heard recently that there's a lot of fear of taking advantage of 
flexible ways of working policy that it's going to stall people in their careers or limit women in being considered for promotions or the next role. Any thoughts or feedback on that that I could take back to the workplace? <laughs> we have a lot. That's all. No. Yes. Oh. There, there uh, were articles, uh, in, I believe in the Times, uh, about how people are more likely to be laid off if they were remote workers and women are heavier users. This is a growing litigation area. I, I'll, I'll just, I read a great article last night by Erin Grau. She wrote an article for Fortune um, that talked about um, hybrid work actually as an, as an equalizer. But there was another article that I read before that talked about how um, flexible work actually is a feminist idea and that we need to stop being so apologetic about asking for what we need. And that um, when men, this is, was a really interesting research study, that when men, men establish their flexible needs when they join a company. And we as women sometimes are a little bit more timid to ask for what we need because we assume that it's going to be that it's going to will be looked at in a in a certain light. So one of the things that we've got to do is let go of that guilt and feel more empowered and a little bit more entitled to ask for what we need for or to ask for what we need because if we don't do that if we don't prioritize ourselves then we start to chip away at those wonderful things that make us us and that give us our superpowers. So that's not the full answer to your question, but I do, it, this was, this, it just really resonated with me because we've got to shift our mindset from obligation to balance, and we've got to put ourselves first. And when we do that, more things fall into place. I just want to add one quick thing, and that is, I do think we also have to be vigilant in this uh, came up in our previous, in the previous, the, the fireside <laughs> chat discussion. I do think there is a sense among some out there that, you know, since the pandemic and now everyone's doing it, everything is fine, you know, because uh, everyone's doing it. No one's, no one's being disadvantaged. And I think uh, the verdict's still out on that. When we think about who's coming back into the office, who's wanting to stay remote, I think the point was made earlier that maybe it, it's a little too soon to collect the data on that. But I do think we need to be, be vigilant and not have others convince us that no, every there's no negative impact here. Everything is okay now. So that's what I would throw in. And I hope I haven't stolen the thunder off my colleague who's been looking at that with me, Samita Raghuram, who's gonna be on a later panel. She'll talk about this too, but I couldn't resist. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, I know we have, one more question um, here. Um, we we can take this one. Yeah. This is my exercise for today. This is um, I guess a follow up. Can you hear me? Is a follow up question maybe for Sharon? I'm um, looking at the role of the managers being open to the, the flexible accommodating flexibility for their employees. Do you find differences um, based on age and or gender? So like. I kind of admit I have in my head the male manager refusing to let women have the flexibility, but do you also find that women might also be less accommodating of it? And then is there an age difference that, you know, eventually when, once the current 20 year olds become middle managers, they'll be more open to this, what I'm wondering. And so in fairness, if I were to give an evidence-based response, I, I don't think we have the data on that, to be honest. Not that I've seen, so contradict me if I'm wrong, not that I've seen. And so that's, uh, when we talked about these tensions in the review that we did, one of the things we found was that we actually don't, where the research needs to go is to understand what are these contingencies, whether it be age, status in the organization, that will tend to make the tension swing more to the negative side or the positive side, right? Whether it's, is it an industry? Are there industry differences? So I wish I could give you a definitive answer to your question other than just anecdotally, but I, I think the verdict's still out on that. And I think there are a number of, some of my colleagues and I, we, we, that's our next step, trying to tease out those things. A study in industry of grocery store leaders, and contrary to what uh, you would think 
women uh, managers were not necessarily more supportive of flexibility, but part of it was, you think about grocery retail, very tough job. There were a lot of single mothers and maybe you have less resources to be able to give flexibility. You don't have somebody to cover for you. So I think we have to get beyond simple binary gender and age type dichotomies and look at sort of what's called the, uh, the cluster of backgrounds of the people in that management team. For example, I've worked with an organization where leaders at the top were more likely to be divorced because it was such a long hours culture. So I think you've got to do this multi-level. What's the industry parameters? What's the job parameters? And not be so, not criticizing, but picking one variable may not tell us what we need to know. I did want to take an opportunity to address some of the questions that have come up online. So one of them is, um, given that some jobs require physical presence to be completed, like manufacturing, engineering, medical, are we concerned that a pay gap could develop between those willing to be present physically versus those who are demanding a more flexible or remote career? I mean, there's a lot there, but... Um, Again, it goes back to what the policies are, right? And um, we, even at our organization, have roles that require physical presence um, because that's the job. So it actually really starts with what we call jobs to be done and what are the jobs to be done. But we also make it a point every single year to do a global pay equity study. And all organizations are sitting on a ton of data. And if you are a nerd like me, then when you get your hands on all that data, whether it comes from compensation studies that we do, whether it comes from benchmarking, whether it comes from engagement surveys or other ways in which we pulse our employees, we are sitting on a lot of data. And then being able to kind of understand the intersectionality components of that data and looking to see the impacts of that. So for example, with our purpose first policy, one of the things that we asked our employees who are not fully remote to do, because we, we hired a lot of fully remote people during the pandemic and their job doesn't, their job didn't require for them to be in then, it doesn't require them to be in now. It's different, of course, in manufacturing and other jobs in healthcare that require some physical presence, but and I'll just give an, organ, uh, an example from us. So we um, asked the, what, the workers who were hybrid to tell us, I plan on coming in every day. I plan on coming in once a week, or I plan on coming in just when there's big things. And then we're using, and, and we wanted them to be declarative and to have a conversation with their manager. And we trained our managers before we ask the question. So that's, I think, to go to the other question that you've got to actually start at the top. There are lots of grassroots efforts, but you've got to train the managers before you put anything out to the employees or else they feel, and as a leader with minor control issues, you know, we all feel that, you know, we need to be in the know. We need to be able to, to manage that. But we are all sitting on a lot of data. And so finding the correlation and doing some of the studies and understanding adverse impacts or where we're getting a boost and what the impact is on retention, what the impact is on promotion, looking to see uh, promotion rates for women versus for um, men, looking to see promotion rates for fully remote employees versus for hybrid employees versus for fully in the, so you're, all organizations are sitting on a lot of data. Really, it's, are you asking the right questions? I guess I'll just jump in on that one as well. Uh, so my response is yes, I'm very concerned. It goes back to some of the conversations we were having before around, you know, we, we kind of had this honeymoon period where everyone was uh, working remotely. And now as we begin to see who's going back into the office, who's choosing to stay home, I, I do think we've got to be very vigilant and looking at the data. I also think we've got to get beyond this notion of, um, and your organization is a great organization of one that is really progressive in this area, that these blanket policies where people think everyone should be working the same way within an organization, it really just, just depends on the job that's being done and what that warrants, right? And so uh, training uh, employees and managers to understand that, that just because over here in one group, some people are working remotely more than in this group, it's, it gets to what's the job being done in that group. We should remember that proximity bias happens at an, a subconscious level, right? And so uh, bringing that to the awareness uh, so that uh, people understand the tendency to do that is also important as well. So that goes back to training, big proponent of the training. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, speaking of proximity bias, I want to give Issa a chance to um, provide any comments uh, that she 
would like to regarding this question? Thank you, Lauren. I had someone about actually just asking me that. And I think there's a question that was made in the chat that is very interesting. They were asking whether we have any data on how people uh, go to the office or not. Women in uh, specifically, depending on their career stage. So mentioning the fact that younger women want to go to the office to make sure that they are not missing in networking opportunities and how that they this may affect differently to senior women who choose to stay remotely. I have to admit that we don't have data on this yet. It's actually one of the questions that we ask in our paper. When there was one study that I want to mention that I found very interesting and is uh, one that looked at a big consulting firm and how just by promoting social networks, so making everyone's knowledge available to everyone in the company, that increases the performance and the networking opportunities of women and younger employees. Because people were not relying on who they knew in order to answer a question or a project, but on what people knew. And because this was now remote, uh, women's knowledge and career opportunities increased. So I think that's an interesting point of seeing not only what we can do regarding remote or not, but also creating an environment where we are also like sharing everyone knowledge and who might help us and not relying so much on who's next door and who's in the same office. Thank, thank you, Issa. I think we have a question in the back. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to raise some issues that I think that we're not addressing um, because the notion of whether you have to be in the office or not be in the office has been around for a long time. And I think of my own career as an academic uh, going back to 47 years ago when I first started at Northwestern University, uh, nobody came to the office because we lived proximate to a large city. People wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to be in their own places. And so the only rules were that you had to be there to teach and you had to be there once a week for a department seminar. And other than that, no one was ever in the office. And that goes back prior to the internet and prior to um, the kind of technologies that we now take for granted. And of course, one of the reasons that it was feasible and that it worked was because uh, these were academics who were doing their own work, who were evaluated for their output, not for uh, their time in the office. And so we can go back to uh, Bill Ucci's work that goes back to that same time about whether their work is um, measured by the output or measured by the input. And increasingly, uh, work is measured by the output. Now, obviously, that's not true of everybody. It is still the case that there is some work where you have to be there, but increasingly, that work is also uh, shifting in ways that we have never thought of before. So we currently have doctor's appointments online. We have education online. We have uh, you know, court appearances online and so on and so forth. And so, yes, there is <clears throat> some proportion of work where you do have to be there in person, but it is often much less than what um, uh, we often think about. Uh, and so I do think we have to sort of shift our mindset in terms of thinking about where the advantages and the disadvantages and what's feasible and what isn't feasible even back 47 years ago when I first started my academic career uh, and we didn't have all the kind of technologies that we currently have, it was still the case that you were kind of evaluated by whether you um, made, not physically present, but you made yourself known. And it was whether you could speak up and whether you were there when you needed to be, whether you did the output that had to be done. And uh, I, I think that we are in, in some ways talking about the present in ways that is not as far into the future as it should be. 
And so I do think that we need to think about some of the ways in which work has dramatically changed and which women as well as men can engage differently in terms of both how they show up and how they get evaluated. And it often is because of output, not so much by input. Yep, and then we have to wrap it up. I think this has been such a productive conversation. Yeah, so I'm so sorry. It's in line with what she's saying. And also think that we need to define the tension, the flexibility tension, because I, I can actually be in office and if the office is not flexible enough, I may not perform, the output may not be worthwhile. Why I can be remote and the flexibility is still there and still yet I will still have a positive outcome. So I think the term flexibility needs to cross across the job because I interviewed someone last week and she was telling me that she's actually going in person for the work due to lack of flexibility. She wants to resign. So I think there should be a definition in time of that flexibility so that we can get a proper findings. Thank you. So Lauren, while you get the mic, let me jump into one last question that was shared in the chat that I found fascinating and is the role of childcare, how some women, even though they can go to the office and I want to go, they decide to stay at home because childcare is closer. So whether we have any data on how on-job childcare might affect this, again, with the, all this research is very recent regarding a post-pandemic uh, reality, I would say we don't have data on that. Although anecdotally, we know, for example, in DC, where Lauren, Sharon, and I were at least last year, those big organizations that have in one job inside childcare, people are going back to the office way more than in other remote work. So if we think of the World Bank, IMF, and all these organizations where the childcare is in the bottom uh, floor and then you work, there's those people are going back to the office and masses because everything is so easy where I totally see that. And just to wrap up one final comment that I would like to make, again, that I'm talking and joining you guys from Spain is that there's also a need to look to cultural differences because the way remote work, it's been implemented varies drastically by countries and by cultures. So I think there's very few research, we have very little research on that aspect, but it's definitely something to look at in the future also. And with this, Lauren, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much, Issa. Um, so that really concludes our session. Um, I just want to thank our panelists for their insights. And um, yeah, thank you. I think that was a really lively discussion. We talked about some future research needs. We talked about um, some of the challenges that we're facing, some opportunities as well. And so that's the gist of what we want to get out of the rest of the day. So great job kicking it off.